Well, this is the podcast for Multi-Faith Matters. I'm the host, John Moorhead, and I'm privileged today to have a returning guest, David Livingston Smith, and I'll go ahead and read his bio, although with the work that he's doing, he needs no introduction. <laughs> David is a professor of philosophy at the University of New England. He earned an MA from Antioch University and a PhD in philosophy from the University of London, King's College. Uh, David has written or edited nine books, his 2011 book, Less Than Human, Why We Demean, Enslave, and Exterminate Others, won the 2012 Ansfield, uh, excuse me, Annisfield Wolf Award for Nonfiction. In fact, the last time uh, David was on the program, we talked about that book. David's most recent book, which we're going to be talking about today, On Inhumanity, Demon, Dehumanization and How to Resist It, uh, was published by Oxford, Oxford University Press. Or excuse me, that's not his most recent book. Uh, that one was published in 2020, and his 10th book, which we are talking about today, yeah. Making Monsters, The Uncanny Power of Dehumanization, was published through Harvard University Press, and that's the focus of our conversation today. David, welcome back to the program. Thank you, and you were not entirely incorrect, because <laughs> Making Monsters is, a, is out later this month, in fact, okay. so... It, in Humanity is technically my most recent book. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, thanks for trying to, to help me there with the introduction. Sure. Uh, it, it, by the time, uh, this will air in October, and hopefully it'll be close to uh, to when folks are able to access what will then yeah. be uh, your newest my book. My most recent book, yeah. Um, we're talking about uh, dehumanization, and just to kind of answer a question that evangelicals and other Christians might have at the outset, why in the world are you talking about this subject? Um, as I have looked at conflict, group, intergroup conflict, particularly where religion is involved, I think dehumanization is, is hugely important. And uh, there are, as you have noted, very few scholars addressing this. I think you're starting to see more. But yes. I, I want to address this topic because I think my audience needs to understand how this process takes place, what it is, how it contributes not only to things like genocide, uh, racism, in the form of things like lynchings, but also, I have some concerns, and I'll ask as we go along, your thoughts on whether dehumanization is taking place sometimes in, in contemporary Christian circles, or maybe we're on the way towards that with some of the terminology and theological language and concepts that are used in regards to others. So I, I want us to, to unpack this. If we could, let's not begin with the abstract. Can you share some historical examples of dehumanization that have taken place maybe in the past, and if there have been some that are more recent that you think are notable? Sure. Well, the, the two examples I like to, to use most frequently because they're very thoroughly documented are the, um, the atrocities committed against Black Americans during the Jim Crow era, in particular what are known as spectacle lynchings, and which were public lynchings attended sometimes by thousands of people in which the, the victim was tortured and mutilated and eventually burned to death, uh, and the Holocaust. So both of those involved quite explicit, blatant dehumanization. And when I say that, what I mean is both of those in, involved one group of people, white Americans, in the first case, and, uh, and Gentile Germans in the second case, regarding another group of people, Black people in the first case, and uh, Jews in the second case, as less than human creatures, as subhuman creatures. And not merely, by the way, uh, and this is really important, not merely as vermin or, or predators, but as, as demonic, as monstrous, as embodiments of evil. Um, so it was that take, and these are just two examples. And by the way, both examples had religious elements to them. Um, these are just two examples of something which uh, is regrettably all too common. It doesn't always eventuate in that degree of atrocity, that degree of violence, but it's certainly, you know, without a doubt, the most 
grotesque examples of mass violence, at least over the last several hundred years, have pretty regularly uh, involved an element of dehumanization. And dehumanization is also present in less overtly violent, but nonetheless derogatory and antagonistic attitudes towards groups of people. So one might think of, say, um, undocumented immigrants. Well, I say one might, some people do. As rather than as you know, poor souls caught up in a in a uh, humanitarian crisis, when pe people sometimes think of them as filthy, dangerous, predatory creatures, right? They don't go out and lynch them or send them to the gas chambers. Uh, nonetheless, the attitude is there and, and the potential under the right circumstances for terrible, terrible acts of violence is, is there. It's important, uh, as you do in your book, to talk about how, how are we defining this process? There are other similar or related kinds of phenomena, and you're very careful in your book to, to describe what you're talking about. How are you conceptualizing and theorizing dehuman, uh, dehumanization? So what is it and what it is what is it not? Yeah, yeah. So I try to tackle that question early on in the book because the term dehumanization often uh, sheds more heat than light. Uh, it's, it's become sort of a catch-all for all kinds of derogatory attitudes or derogatory actions. Uh, so some people, for instance, would think of dehumanization as just, just a lack of empathy or as cruel uh, treatment um, or as thinking of others as inanimate objects. I have a very particular notion of what dehumanization is. It's not that I'm saying this is the right one. It's just that dehumanization means lots of different things. So if we really want to understand it or understand any of these things, we need to be specific. We need to dis make distinctions. Uh, so I think of dehumanization at first of all as an attitude. It's something that, that occurs inside your head. And it's the attitude of thinking of others as less than human creatures. And I choose those terms very carefully. So creatures, I notice I don't say animals. I say creatures, that's to include the demonic and the monstrous. Um, now, just because I say that Humanization is an attitude doesn't mean it can be looked at entirely psychologically. Because to understand what's in people's heads, we have to understand what people's heads are in. We have to understand the forces acting on them that shape them, that mold them, that cause them to have the attitudes that they have. So the, the footnote I'll add to that definition I just gave you is that Dehumanization is a psychological response to political forces, in particular response to propaganda and ideology. It doesn't arise unbidden from within. It's, it's responsive to others getting us to think of some groups of people as subhuman beings. Uh you note in uh, your forthcoming book uh, that you wanted to revisit this topic because there'd been a development in your, your thinking. What, what changed? What did you encounter? How did your thinking evolve between what you wrote previously and what we see in this new volume? Okay, so there, it, it has in several respects. So if you go back to my first book on dehumanization, Less Than Human, I was kind of working it out as I went along. This was uncharted territory. You know, the, uh, at, at that time, and it's still true today, almost all of the literature on dehumanization is uh, in social psychology. And you just can't grasp dehumanization from that limited perspective, precisely because, as I said, it straddles 
the psychological and the political and the cultural and the social and all, all of that. Um, so, you know, I was piecing it together and trying to theorize it and so on. And I, I think I made substantial progress then, but obviously there are going to be uh, weaknesses. Well, in the intervening decade, I could pursue this topic a lot more and I could refine my views on what dehumanization is and how it works. So I, I think the, uh, apart from going much more deeply into the specifics, the two real innovations are things that I've, I've kind of alluded to already. So let me spell them out. Um, I think now, that dehumanization, the attitude of dehumanization, is it's sort of an unsuccessful solution to a problem. So let me lay out the problem. We human beings, and this is an uncontestable fact, are highly social beings. There is no other mammal, certainly no other primate, that is as sociable as we are. You know, we work in large cooperative groups, we make sacrifices for one another, uh, and our, our sociology extends beyond our immediate communities. See, with lots of social animals, if you compare human beings to social animals, uh, their sociality is limited to the immediate breeding group. That's not the case with us. And we've since for thousands of years, we know, we have evidence that our sociality has been much more extensive. Now, to maintain a social existence, we can't be at each other's throats, right? We can't be killing each other for obvious reasons. I mean, it's just, we, we, we couldn't pull off our social existence and our social existence is the secret of our success. I mean, if, if you look, uh, at the, the, say, the, the furniture in the room, in the house where I am, and the clothing that I wear. These are all products of extensive cooperative networks of, of people. Uh, on our own, we would be living really terrible, what Thomas Hobbes called brutish short lives, right? Um, so any social like uh, any social being like ourselves needs to have built in reluctance to do lethal harm to their, their fellows. Uh, evolution, I think has built this into us. It, it's, it's really unattractive and psychologically difficult to up close and personal do lethal violence to someone. It's not like in the movies, right? Where people just shoot each other and they're all, you know, they're fine, they smoke a cigarette or whatever. In fact, the act of killing for most of us in situations where we have to, it is deeply traumatic. It's, it, it haunts people for a lifetime. Now, being the clever beings that we are with these great big brains, we also have been capable of recognizing that it can be advantageous to do awful things to people, to enslave them, to exterminate them, to, to, um, to remove them from competition. And you know, we can think, well, you know, those people over there across the river, uh, gee, wouldn't it be great for us if we could like wipe them out? Now, if you look at it in that way, human beings would be stuck between a rock and a hard place, right? On the one hand, there are these inhibitions against lethal harm. On the other hand, we can recognize it, there's some advantages in these sorts of campaigns against our fellow human beings. Over time, we developed lots of ways to disable those inhibitions. You know, we are cultural beings, and I see culture as a kind of self-engineering. It's a way of, that we have found to get ourselves to do things which would otherwise be very difficult for us to do. 
dehumanization is one way of doing that. So if we can render these others as, as subhuman, then it becomes permissible in our own minds to treat them the way that we treat those other animals that we consider to be less than human. Right, so that, that really was the story in, in less than human, but it's not the complete story. There's something very, very important missing to this story. So let, let me go on. There are two problems with the way I describe dehumanization in less than human. I call them the problem of humanity and the problem of monstrosity. Here's the problem of humanity. If we actually look at episodes of dehumanization, what we find is those who dehumanize others are not consistent. Uh, sometimes they implicitly describe others in ways that are only suitable for describing human beings, for instance, as criminals, or perform actions like humiliating their victims. You don't humiliate cockroaches, right? It doesn't make any sense. Humili if you're humiliating, it implies that you recognize the, the, the humanness of those whom you are humiliating. Um, uh, so most of the people who have raised this concern talk about it being implicit. But I actually, I think it's often explicit. It's often explicit that the dehumanizers, on one hand, will refer to these others as subhuman creatures, and on the other hand, refer to them as human beings. And it, it can flip-flop within the space of a single sense. All right, so this is pretty widely distributed in the small philosophical literature on dehumanization. It's, it's a common, commonly made point. And it's led some people to be skeptics about dehumanization. Say, well, you see, dehumanization can't really be real. It, it's got to be that you are, uh, when, when people seem to be dehumanizing others, they're just trying to, they're just using their words as weapons to degrade them, but they don't really think of them as subhuman. Okay, let's set that to one side. The problem of monstrosity is, as far as I know, I'm the only person who has raised this criticism against my own work, which is kind of a cool position to be in. The problem of monstrosity is that when we look at the most toxic and the most dangerous, the most horrific forms of dehumanization, uh, it's not just that the other is regarded as an animal, even a, you know, a repulsive animal like a louse or a tick. The other is typically regarded as a demonic being or a monster. And that's something really different, right? <laughs> Monsters are really different from, from wolves or lice or cockroaches. So there's something else going on there. Now, well, bear with me. I'll get to the end of my answer to this question sure. in a moment. Okay, so I think these two problems are resolved in the same way. If there's one important tweak to my theory that addresses both of them. So here it goes. Recall that I emphasize the point that human beings are highly social. One of the implications of that is that we are exquisitely sensitive to the humanness of one another. When you look into another human face, another pair of human eyes, you cannot help but respond in a certain way. You can't help but see human. This is automatic. It happens at a gut level. Bang. Okay. But on the other hand, part of being um, a member of our species, part of being a human being, involves what we philosophers call epistemic deference to authority. Human culture, in, in order for human culture to exist, we, we have to get a lot of our knowledge and a lot of our beliefs from others. It's just it's handed down, handed down, handed. So they are trusted authorities. You know, so 
uh, when I get my, when I got my vaccination for COVID, I mean, I don't know really how the vaccination works, um, but I trust the medical scientists who develop this and say, look, you take this vaccine and you will have a good measure of protection against this terrible disease. Because I regard them as people who are supposed to know, I trust them. I trust people even when what they say contradicts what my eyes tell me. So my favorite example is the table in front of me. Physicists tell me it's mostly empty space. It doesn't look like that to me. Right? It looks like it's got no gaps at all. But I accept what the physicists say. Why? Because I grant that they have this epistemic authority. They're the ones who are supposed to know. And so I defer to them. Now, that trust, that sort of leap of faith that's required there is, as I said, it's important. It's necessary for human life. But it also makes us vulnerable because we can be misled. Now, here's where the rubber meets the road. When people dehumanize others, as I said, it doesn't arise spontaneously from within. It's responsive to messages coming from the outside. And historically, if you look, it's a matter of people who are placed in positions of authority who tell us something like this. These others, they might look like human beings, but you know on the inside, they're not really human. On the inside, there's something else. There's something animalistic, verminous. They're counterfeit human beings. And just as I take on board what the medical scientists tell me about the COVID vaccine, if I say I'm a German citizen in 1939, I take on board what the Nazi race experts tell me about Jewish people. They're supposed to know. Or what the distinguished scholars in the United States in the 19th century said about black people. They're a separate species. They're not one of us. The, the, the problem is it's actually rational to do this, right? It's rational to trust those who are supposed to know. If we didn't, we'd be lost. So. What happens then? Well, I said, we can't help seeing human. We can't help responding to others as human beings. That's just built into us. Um, but at the same time, we place trust in those who are supposed to know. Uh, so what the result of this, I believe, is that when we dehumanize others, so that, is, that is when we take the advice of the Nazi race expert or the, the, you know, the toxic radio host or this, the celebrity making pronouncements about something they know nothing about. And we take that on board. We form an image of the other as subhuman. But at the same time, we can't help seeing them as human. So we have two contradictory pictures at once, human and subhuman. And this obviously explains the problem of humanity, right? That we, it seems that the conscious mind can't hold both of these at the same time. It's like the, the famous duck rabbit uh, picture. Sometimes you see it as a duck, sometimes you see it as a rabbit, but you can't see it as both at the same time. So this flip-flop between human and subhuman on, on the, the minds of the, and in the speech of the dehumanizers. On the other hand, uh, there's, there's the problem of monstrosity. So here we have to get into monster theory a little bit. And I, don't, I won't go real deep into it, at, at least at this point. But the, the monsters in the sense of horror, horrific monsters are impossible beings. They're impossible fusions of incompatible things. They have incompatible properties. So if you take the example of zombies, like in zombie movies, what is it that makes them so frightening? Well, they're out to eat your brains, but 
they don't seem physically very formidable. I mean, they're tottering around like, like you know, a stiff breeze could blow them over. So why are they so terrifying? Because they're alive and dead at the same time. That's impossible. And when we get this sort of violation of the natural order, it, it produces this very special disturbing state of mind, which is often called the uncanny. So this contradictory representation of others also solves the problem of monstrosity, right? It, it turns them into monsters. Paradoxically, it's the, the failure of dehumanization in the sense of the failure, our failure to see others simply as less than human animals that transmutes them into monstrous demonic beings. And this makes the whole situation much more dangerous, much more toxic, because what do you do with a monster? A monster is the embodiment of evil. The monster is to be killed. Nothing is too extreme for dealing with the monster. And well, we get genocide. Well, I was uh, excited when I saw, I, I follow you on Facebook and uh, to see your mention of your work on the book and the, the title Making Monsters and it's got a great cover. I'll, I'll use that cover rather than our handsome faces to promote this on YouTube. I'll use the cover of the book. I, I think it's uh, important and an important element that you have added to that. I, I have uh, been a fan of, of monster theory in my academic and popular work for many years. What is it that did you just, how did you come across monster theory and decide that this is something, this is a, what was your aha moment for this is an element that I need to add to this? I, I think it was, um, uh, this may be incorrect because this, <laughs> it's a long and storied process, but I think it was when I was studying spectacle lynchings. So spectacle lynchings, like I, I think I mentioned earlier, were these lynchings, uh, not like you see in the movies, where uh, a black person is just hung from a tree. They were public lynchings. They were attended by thousands of men, women, and children, sometimes up to 15, maybe 20,000 people. They were highly ritualistic. In fact, the scholar Orlando Patterson, the sociologist, has described them as rituals of human sacrifice. And they had very important religious overtones, by the way. Again, Patterson is a very good source on this. They were typically done on Sundays, for instance, after church, often in the proximity of a church. Um, in any case, I, I emphasize this because of your, your audience. I, they might find that sure. interesting. Yeah. Um, so, like I said, they typically involved hours of the most brutal torture imaginable. Um, uh, dismemberment, castration, uh, sometimes requiring the victim to eat parts of their own bodies, and then they slowly burn them to death. Uh, and you know, I emphasize slowly, it was like in the, the witch burnings of centuries past, where the victim, the problem with burning people to death is they die of asphyxiation. So if you really want them to suffer, you have to make sure that doesn't happen. And that requires a certain amount of skill burning slowly from the bottom up. So the, and, and then parts of the body were taken as souvenirs, bones, bits of internal organs that had been cooked in the burning and so on. So when I was studying these things, I made a point of looking at newspaper reports of them. Because these things were covered in, in the press in the United States. And very typically, the victims were described as demonic, not simply as animals, some, not to the exclusion of describing them as animals, but as fiends, as monsters, as monsters in human form. I thought, oh, that's interesting, you know, that doesn't quite fit my account that I had developed. Uh, so I, that's kind of sparked my interest. So I read a little bit about monster theory. And the book that really did it for me was Noel Carroll's uh, book, uh, Philosophy of Horror, which I think is a wonderful book. And it's actually an interesting book. Most philosophy books, in my opinion, are 
pretty boring. <laughs> it takes some effort to get through them and stay awake. But, but it is. And, and Carol, um, what Carol does is he, one of the questions he tries to answer is what makes a monster? Carol thinks that there are two components to being a monster in the sense of the monsters of horror fiction. One is the monster has to be physically dangerous, right? They're, they're going to do something to your body. They're going to kill you. They're going to tear you apart, whatever. But that doesn't distinguish monsters from other dangerous beings of a more prosaic type, like grizzly bears and rattlesnakes and serial killers and so on. The monster also has to be what he calls cognitively threatening, and I call metaphysically threatening. And something that's cognitively threatening is, is let me reverse that sentence, beings that, in, that are impossible beings, who are these weird fusions of incompatible things are cognitively threatening. He doesn't say so, but my argument is it's because they seem to violate the order of nature itself. So, you know, if, if a dead person can walk, a zombie, what does that imply? Well, it implies anything can happen, right? The world suddenly becomes very unsafe. We, we count on our picture of the natural order to give ourselves a modicum of security and safety. But if that's up for grabs, and this is something that's exploited in, in horror movies, by the way, where the, uh, the, the victims are up against something that they, they just can't deal with because it violates every norm that they took for granted of how things are. Um, so, so that's how I went through from, from lynching, I think, to, to Carol's book. And then I... I, I went to two, three other places. I mean, Carol cites Mary Douglas, the anthropologist. He draws a lot on her work. And she operated on very similar territory in her, her famous book, Purity and Danger, uh, published in 1966. But from there, I went to another place, which is the, the pioneering work on, on this stuff, which is a paper published in 1906 by a German psychiatrist named Ernst Dietsch. And he was interested in theorizing uh, what, what he calls the unheimlich, which is typically translated, I think somewhat misleadingly often as the uncanny, this kind of disturbing, creepy, horrific sort of um, feeling that one gets from something. So all of that stuff hangs together. That was my trajectory towards monstrosity. And then when I put it together really properly with my account of dehumanization, I realized how vital it is. It explains a lot. It captures aspects of the phenomenology of dehumanization, which were previously inaccessible to me for any sort of explanation. Well, I think it adds a, a huge dimension to that as someone who's engaged with that in other venues for many years. I have put forward the idea in social media, and maybe I'll have to pick up the mantle. I would love to see a multidisciplinary volume that deals with monster theory incorporated in interreligious conflict and how that manifests mm. itself. Mm. And to pick up on that, um, as I've looked at dehumanization and monster theory myself, it just occurred to me looking at the conservative Christian community that maybe at times we engage in forms of dehumanization drawing upon theological terminology and concepts. Mm -hmm. So in the present, for example, I've seen some uh, Christians refer to Muhammad, the founder of Islam, as a demon-possessed pedophile. Mm -hmm. And to me that uh, the demon-possessed draws upon the theological concept but the pedophile is the human monster that yeah. has to be destroyed. And this founder of this whole religion was monstrous. And therefore, the religion itself and its adherents are, are monstrous. So some of my fears are we're, we're using, we're drawing upon our own concepts, our own language. We're clothing monster, uh, dehumanization with the concept of the sacred, which has been a problem, not only for Christianity, but other religions historically. Now, in your book, in uh, chapter two, you talk about... Uh, the demonization of Jews 
uh, by European Christians. Can you talk a little bit about how that process took place? Sure, sure. I mean, it's there's a long history, and what I tried to do in that chapter is trace that that history and sort of connect it to the story I tell about how ideology works, and um, and 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 to connect it with the more recent atrocities. But we can go back really to the the late first century, the early second century, to the Gospel of John. There was a very there is. There goes my dog. Um, a, a very influential passage in which Jesus is berating those Jews who will not accept him as the Messiah. And of course, in Judaism, the Messiah is like a real big thing. <laughs> it's not some sort of trivial uh, matter at all. And he, he refers to them as children of the devil. Uh, and uh, the devil but it's in the passage is a liar and a murderer. Now that was an influential passage. One of the problems facing Christianity early on, and you can place this passage in that context, was differentiating it from itself from Judaism. Uh, there, there is a theory that Islam had the same problem. There is a theory that that Islam was was initially an offshoot of Judaism, you know, the old religion. All the others are youngsters in the, the Abrahamic religion. Uh, I am Jewish, by the way. Um, so, uh, you know, that got morphed into a claim about Jews generally. You know, in the context, Jesus is, is ranting at particular Jews, but it got interpreted as pertaining to Jews generally. The next step, I mean, the very, very crucial one historically was the um, Augustine, Bishop of Hippo. And uh, Augustine made two very important contributions. One was he, he took the figure of Judas as a representative of the Jewish people generally. So that, that's the seed of the, the money-grubbing Jew, you know, mm -hmm. a, a stereotype which became so toxic later on. But Augustine also says, look, Jews must be allowed to live and practice their religion, albeit in a state of wretchedness. And this was, he intended this as sort of propagandist, well, propagandistic in the following sense, the continued existence of Jews uh, was evidence of the origins of Christianity. So it gave that Christianity a kind of credibility. Uh, it was also good propaganda for converting pagans. Um, remember, the Jews were permitted to live, but in a condition of wretchedness. Now, most Christians didn't pay much attention to these derogatory representations of Jews. They got on to their everyday life. But that eventually changes. Um, and it changes uh, in the late 11th century with the First Crusade. The First Crusade, you know, the uh, Pope Urban makes the speech in France and the Crusaders, it really caught on and the Crusaders march off to win back uh, the Holy Land from, from the Muslim infidel. Well, <laughs> as on their way, they decided to exterminate whole Jewish communities. And there was, there seems to have been an association in their minds between Jews and Muslims. Um, this comes out very, very clearly in uh, the 14th century. So the position of Jews in Europe degrades now over the next few centuries. There are important sociological factors that contributed to that. Um, in the 14th century, what happened? The pandemic, the bubonic plague. Uh, the bubonic plague was blamed in many communities on Jews. That Jews were um, poisoning Christians. Jews were trying to destroy, they were in league with Muslims to destroy Christian civilization. Now, Something happened in between here, right? 
And, and that was the growing racialization and dehumanization of Jews. So I, I think a crucial date is 1215 with the Fourth Lateran Council. Various Jim Crow-like regulations were put into place for regulating what Jews could do and could not do. And it's around this time that Jews start being accused of two things, torturing the sacramental host. Now, that sounds weird, that's like torturing a wafer. But at the, the Fourth Lateran Council, it became official church doctrine that the host is literally the body of Christ. So if you torture the host, you're torturing Christ himself. You're, you're committing an act of deicide, as Jews had been you know, accused of uh, with, the, with the, the murder of Christ all that long time ago. So there are all these accusations. These were accompanied by accusations of human sacrifice and cannibalism. Um, so the idea became current first that Jews kidnapped Christian children, Christian boys, and ritually murdered them. The Christian boy, again, is a stand-in for Christ. That's the idea. It's a proxy for Christ. That morphed into the so-called blood libel, that not only um, do they, did they sacrifice Christian boys, but drain them of blood, which they mixed with matzo, matzo meal for the, for the Passover meal. Now, if you know about Jewish dietary regulations, that's like as far out as you can get, right? Jews have like a horror of blood. Uh, but this, this, right, so now, see, cannibalism is a standard dehumanizing trope. Along the way, ideas developed of Jewish biological difference. The idea that Jews had horns under their their headgear, that Jews had tails, that Jews had a, that Jewish men menstruated, that, um, that Jewish people had a distinctive animalistic smell. Um, so there we get this concatenation of the demonic Jew. It develops into the idea that Jews are in league with the devil, they're children of the devil. And that, of course, has echoes in that passage from the Gospel of John, and are masters of black magic. So they are, have secret control over events. All of these elements persisted. They persisted into the 20th century. And if you look at Nazi propaganda, it, it, they're all there, <laughs> they're all there. From Jews as carriers of the plague to Jews as, as cannibals, and this illustrates something very, very important. Um, once these things get established, they're really, really, really difficult to, to disestablish. So the image of the Jew in particular was so embedded, so fundamentally embedded in the medieval Christian picture of the world, so interwoven, that, that it has persisted and persists to this day. Not always explicitly in relation to Jews, by the way. So the QAnon movement, exactly, all these elements are there. Right. The QAnon movement is, is a new incarnation of this dehumanizing picture, which was originally worked out in relation to Jewish people in the Christian West. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned QAnon. That was kind of going to be my follow-up from listening to your response. It occurs to me that, you know, what you talked about that took place historically is still very much with us. And it's it's interesting and tragic that this, this ideology that includes the idea of the demonic and the satanic seems to be a trope that is constantly revisited, whether in the past or in the present. Would you agree? Yes, I would agree. And it's often not explicit. Uh, this is really important. So um, in the Middle Ages, I mean, everyone believed in demons, right? So the, the image of the dehumanized other as demonic, literally speaking, was, you know, 
perfectly believable. Nowadays, in a more secular world, outside of some religious communities, demons don't cut it, right? Secular people don't believe in demons, but, but there are equivalents, right? If just because they don't use the word, and if you said, you know, do you believe in Satan? They say, no, no, I don't believe in Satan. However, the equivalents carry the same sort of weight. When people are regarded as embodiments of sheer evil, as bad to the bone, as essentially criminal, uh, it's, it's demons by another name, monsters by another name, right? So, you know, we shouldn't be um, deceived. We shouldn't be deceived that just because people are not using literally the religiously infused language of demons that they don't believe in demons <laughs> they, they do yeah my concern for my own religious community is that i see some religious groups more than others uh muslims in this present moment uh historically pagans and of course mm -hmm. uh satanists interestingly enough even though they don't believe in the existence of the, the christian satan Mm -hmm. They're so connected with this idea of the satanic and the demonic that, that we really are, without recognizing it, engaging in monstrosity. And what do you yeah, do so with the monster? You know, you, you, you got to get rid you of destroy. it. Destroy. Yeah. You destroy it. And, and nothing is too extreme for, for destroying the monster. And because the monster is evil, no cruelty is out of bounds. Um, so I, this is a very important point that you're raising, right? To use what is perhaps my favorite Christian image, you know, we're all, we're all damaged vessels, right? None of us is above the vulnerability to dehumanizing thinking. And if you're a member of a religious community, you may grant the authority that say some would, in the Third Reich would grant to someone like Joseph Goebbels to, tell you that these others are not really human beings, right? Because they're the ones that are supposed to know. I mean, there's a very horrible history of this, of people in positions of religious authority um, getting followers to commit atrocities, atrocities which they wouldn't otherwise be inclined to commit. So, you know, in religious communities need to be at least as careful as secular communities about being manipulated by toxic propaganda produced by people who have an investment in us doing terrible things to other people. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> One of the things you talk about in your book is that you're attempting to bring a multidisciplinary approach to the topic, that there hasn't been much out there. You approach it philosophically. That's your background. You mentioned social psychology. In my research, I found a couple of neuroscientists who have looked at it and done some academic work exploring it from that perspective. What would you like to see in the future? What would your hope be for a multidisciplinary approach where scholars from a wide variety of disciplines take this as a serious subject in order for us to understand it and respond to it? Well, yeah. So first let's underline its seriousness. This is not merely academic, right? If, you know, we, if we are inclined to say of Auschwitz, never again, well, words are cheap. <laughs> we need to understand what we're dealing with. And dehumanization straddles a number of different domains. It can't be looked at entirely uh, psychologically for reasons that I described. It can't be looked at purely culturally and politically because psychology plays a big role. I mean, anything that, if we're trying to explain human behavior, we have to take psychology into account. We, it can't be explained entirely through the study of rhetoric um, because rhetoric doesn't float free either from political forces or from, from psychological forces. So we need multidisciplinarity to tackle this and we need to tackle it. It's, it's, it's so important. Humanity is faced with some tremendous challenges in, over the next century. 
And those challenges, I think, will create a perfect storm for, for, for terrible things. It'll, they'll, what I have in mind, of course, is, is catastrophic climate change, where we're gonna have massive movements of populations. The gap between the haves and the have nots will widen. Um, refugee problems like the world has never known, the collapse of infrastructures and so on. And this is important. It's important because dehumanizing propaganda gets a grip on us to the extent that we feel vulnerable and helpless. So this is another component that I've added to my picture since 2011. Became very interested in, in, in propaganda and how authoritarian leaders manage to influence their followers. And, and oddly enough, what I found extremely helpful is Freud, Freud's account of religious belief, which, which by the way, is deeply compassionate. You know, Freud is an atheist like Karl Marx was, but his attitude is not at all contemptuous. As he puts it in his book, The Future of an Illusion, religious beliefs are the fulfillment of the deepest, most powerful, most urgent wishes of mankind. And in his analysis, we yearn for religious salvation because all of us know in our hearts of hearts how vulnerable we are. We're vulnerable to injustice and we're vulnerable to the forces of nature. And of course, we yearn for some deliverance. We, we yearn for the bad people to be punished. We yearn for protection from pain and from death. And that's part of the human condition. Now, I think this is a, something that the authoritarian leader, be they secular or religious, exploits. Uh, the, the leader, and this is really, in, in a way, it's kind of counterintuitive, unless you look at it through this lens, typically gets the followers to feel more helpless, more vulnerable. And then after doing that, offers them salvation. Follow me, follow me, only I can do it. You know, Hitler did that precisely. I'll make Germany great again. He says that. Um, so if, if the feelings of helplessness are powerful enough, then all of us are vulnerable to swallowing this kind of message that, you know, this follow the leader message. And part of the process of getting people to feel vulnerable and helpless is to portray them as surrounded by demonic enemies, subhuman enemies that are out to get, get you. They're going to get your children. They're going to destroy everything that's good. That leads to another paradox, which is, is tragic, which is people who do the worst things typically believe that they are saving the world from evil. If you look at every genocide in the last century, those who are committing the atrocities think, you know, they're working for God. They are, they are delivering humanity from all that's evil and decadent and destructive. That's part of the psychology of this thing. Um, so you know, we're, we're kind of surrounded by a lot of dangers and it's only by understanding these processes that we can really hope to protect ourselves from them by being vigilant, by understanding our own vulnerabilities. There's no vaccination, you know, no matter how good and righteous one feels, uh, one is not immune from these things. Um, so what we need then is for this to be taken very, very seriously. There's no place in the world where there's some unit, some, some research unit specifically devoted to researching dehumanization. There just isn't. There's no university department. There's no NGO. You know, be before my, my first book on the subject, there was virtually nothing outside of social psychology, at least in the English language on this subject. And that's got to stop. And I don't think I've got it all right. 
I'm just trying to start a conversation. I'm sure there are lots of things that I don't understand. I'm, I'm sure there's lots in my picture of dehumanization that is crude or actually false. We need others to, to help us <laughs> to, to get at the truth. Well, one final question for you, David, as we draw our, our conversation to a close. Uh, thank you for drawing attention to the fact that, you know, we hope that the academics uh, will get on board, will get more of a multidisciplinary approach, but on a, a practical day-to-day -day level, have you got any thoughts or suggestions on how, let's say somebody uh, reads your book, hopefully, or maybe stumbles across this podcast and they say, man, this, this is a problem. How can I make a difference in my sphere, in my community? What kind of su suggestions would you have? Well, I, I, I think there are there are two fronts in this battle. One is inward looking and one is outward looking. And I guess orthogonal to that, there are, there are another two. One, one is more political and one is more educational. So I'm just gonna dive into this morass a bit. Uh, education, I think is very important, but it has to be the right sort of education. You know, the people who do evil things are often highly educated people. You know, almost half of the 15 men who sat around the table in Wannsee, Germany, and decided on the extermination of the Jews of Europe had PhDs. They were not, they were not a stupid bunch. Uh, and they were not an uneducated bunch. One, one thing we need to understand is education and human nature. We need to understand what it is about ourselves that makes us vulnerable to these sorts of influences. If we don't understand that, we can't track ourselves. We can't, you see, when you're slipping into these ways of thinking, it all seems very rational, it all seems right. So you've gotta be able to catch yourself before slipping into these ways of thinking. And you know, being a little skeptical, pushing back against some of the influences that are brought to bear on you. And there are always people who are trying to get you to do bad things. Another aspect of education is education in history. And I don't mean general history. I think what's most important is the history of whatever group you most identify with. So for Americans, um, American history, but not the cleaned up version, please. It's very, very important. Nations, religions, ethnicities, for the most part, they're they're born in bloodshed, they're born in violence and, and, and sustained in oppression. That's just how it is. So all Americans, and we could apply the same principle everywhere else in the world, need to know about just how bloodstained our history has been. And the reason for that is that it produces an attitude of humility. So if we did it in the past, we might do it in the future. We're capable, we're capable of genocide. We're capable of like these spectacle lynchings and so on. Maybe we're even doing it now. In other words, you can entertain possibilities that if you close all that off and you take refuge in illusions of exceptionalism, then you're not going to have the humility that's required for that level of self-monitoring and self-criticism. And, you know, so th this, this program is specifically directed towards conservative Christian communities. I would urge Christians to do that. Look squarely at the bloodstained history of Christianity and resist the temptation to, to clean it up, right? Uh, Owning it is not abandoning what's precious to you. It's just forming a more realistic and a more humble appreciation of the fragilities and the dangers of, 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 of being human and of being religious because religion is power. It's very powerful stuff. You know, I, I'm, I'm not religious, I'm an atheist. But I certainly recognize the immense power of religion for good and for ill. Anything that's powerful for good is powerful for, for ill. And that, that really needs to be looked at. Uh, not just Christians, of course, Muslims, Jews, whoever. Um, 
Additionally, then there's the, the social and political. Speak up when, when people are dehumanizing others. Don't go along with it. <laughs> Don't let it gain momentum and support institutions that protect us. Institutions like a free press, like freedom of speech, like an independent judiciary. These are not foolproof. None of these things are foolproof. You know, with respect to free speech, if you look at the early history of national socialism, Nazis complained about being silenced, having their free speech interfered with. They produced posters of Hitler, you know, with like a duct tape, tape over his mouth. So all of these things can be subverted. There's no magical solution. But altogether, they're important. And finally, and maybe most important, if it's true that our vulnerability to these sorts of influences flows from our sense of helplessness, then it's very, very important to make sure as much as possible that people have basic securities. They have enough to eat, they have work, they have health care. There, there's not this extra um, sense of helplessness, which propagandists can then play on to inspire us to swallow their, their poisonous messages. Well, always helpful advice, and uh, I appreciate uh, you making the time to come and have this conversation, David. Well, I appreciate you inviting me, and, and I, I really love what you're trying to do with this broadcast. It's, Thank you very much. We will uh, include the information. I'll hold it up here for those of you watching on YouTube. If you're listening on the podcast, you won't get that benefit. But this is uh, Making Monsters, the Uncanny Power of Dehumanization. And I uh, highly recommend it. I, I look forward to writing a review of this for Cultural Encounters Journal, a very positive review. And uh, again, my guest today has been David Livingston Smith. If you wait till the end of this video, uh, you'll see a little promo for the first conversation that we had if folks want to go back and visit that conversation as well. Again, this is the Multi-Faith Matters podcast. I'm the host, John Moorhead. Thank you for watching and listening.